I'm Steve Ollier, an associate at Arup Water, and today I want to talk to you about regenerative design, green infrastructure, and their role in our low-carbon future in Wales. We rely on the environment for our survival. It provides us with the clean air we breathe, the clean water we drink, and the food we eat. In fact, our economy depends on it as well. Here in Wales, the environment directly contributes £8.8 .8 billion per year into our economy. That's about 12% of our GDP. And as such, it's very much in our interest to protect and enhance the environment around us. Conversely, if you think about our towns and cities, they've been designed around humans, not nature. And as such, they've had a devastating long-term impact on the environment around them. Regenerative design is about reversing that trend and creating places where people and nature can survive and thrive together. So if you consider your town, your street, and every time it rains at the moment, that rainfall lands on roads and disappears down a road kelly, never to be seen again. The impact of that kind of old drainage system is twofold. First of all, it diverts that flow very quickly to our natural rivers and streams, which don't have capacity for it. And as such, we have a lot of urban flooding. In fact, we've got 163,000 properties in Wales at risk of surface water flooding. The second problem with that kind of system is pollution. So sat on top of every road and every street are heavy metals, hydrocarbons, microplastics. And every time it rains, these all get washed into the river, untreated, and they can have a devastating impact on those sensitive ecosystems. Thirdly, in Wales and the UK, we have a lot of combined sewer systems. So our wastewater and our stormwater travel in the same pipes and during large rainfall events, they will overflow into rivers and so dilute sewage gets into those same sensitive ecological systems. So they're old systems, they're designed around humans and not nature. They're good for us, although they're not so good for us, but they're certainly not good for nature. In comes regenerative design and green infrastructure is a perfect example of that. It flips the equation and it rethinks how we manage that water. Rather than directing it quickly to rivers and streams, that flow is diverted to a network of green spaces, planted areas, wetlands, swales, ditches, urban trees, urban forests. And those systems are better at managing that water. First of all, they can manage the peak flow. So during named storms of the last two or three years, Storm Jorge and Storm Callum, we've had green infrastructure and systems in place in Wales that we've been installing over the past 10 years. And we've had monitors in to assess how they respond to those shock events, which are becoming more and more frequent with climate change. So in those events where our traditional gray systems failed, the green systems showed a much, much greater resilience. So where there was widespread flooding in Wales, where we had green systems, we actually avoided flooding and we saved hundreds of homes from the heartache of flooding during those events. And it's not only that, we've got data that proves that these green systems can act as a buffer for that pollution. They can reduce the impact or how often sewers overflow into rivers, but they can also capture a lot of those contaminants, heavy metals, hydrocarbons and microplastics and stop them ever reaching those sensitive waterways. But it's not only that, the green systems also provide air quality benefits. So urban trees in areas where air quality is poor and perhaps asthma is prevalent, these systems can actually clean up that air for us. And by creating green systems, green corridors and pathways through our towns and cities, we encourage more people to be active, to get out walking and cycling, to walk to work rather than driving. And as such, the community is benefiting. It's a healthier community. And that brings in this idea of preventative healthcare. These green systems are fantastic and they are, they should be considered green assets, critical assets, much like we would consider a pumping station or a flood embankment wall a critical asset. So there are no brainer, right? Well, the challenge is how do we deliver them at scale nationally? Now, if you consider Wales, it's around 2 million hectares. And of that, around 4.5% is urban industrial area. So that's around 90,000 hectares. And at the moment, of those areas, in Wales we're around 16% green forest cover, and that's below 
any European towns and cities and the global cities. So, if we were to aim for a modest increase from 16% to 25%, that would mean greening around 9,000 hectares of grey towns and cities. That represents a significant investment. And key to that investment is understanding the wider benefits. And we know if we can value those wider benefits, that green systems can repay themselves within 30 years. And if you think of that as something that we can install it today, we know it has an instant significant benefit on a community, but also we know that in 30 years, it's gonna be returning that value year on year for our children and our children's children. And we've got legislation backing us too. We've got European, UK government, and here in Wales, we've got the benefit and the ambition of the Future Generations Act. And that's already been delivered through Welsh Water's drainage and wastewater management plans. They're leading the way with the storm overflow assessment framework. Natural Resources Wales are delivering their sustainable management of natural resources plan. And locally in Cardiff, we've very recently seen the release of their 2030 carbon neutral plan. All of these things have green infrastructure at their heart. It's what they're underpinned by. And so it's a challenge for us. How do we turn these pocket piecemeal investments that we know work into something that can be rolled out nationally? How do we fund it? So for those of you who don't live in Wales, you may not realise that we have a unique piece of legislation here called the Wellbeing for Future Generations Act. And the wonderful thing about this is that it requires all public bodies to consider sustainability when they're doing their design. How this applies to the work we do? Well, green infrastructure is a great example of where you're putting those sustainable principles thinking about all the aspects of sustainability, not just the obvious green ones, but the ones about social regeneration, economic assistance, bringing help to deprived areas, biodiversity, cycle routes, all the wonderful little add-ons that can make a scheme so much more than just dealing with water through green infrastructure. It becomes a whole holistic piece that will significantly improve parts of our towns and cities. One wonderful example of this that I've had the pleasure of being involved with from the very start is Greener Grangetown. Now, Greener Grangetown was an idea in a lovely gentleman called Ian Titherington's head way before the Wellbeing of Future Generations Act. He had this vision of making the most of rainwater and rather than sending it straight off to be treated at the treatment works, using it as a catalyst for green growth wonderful regeneration and a change of place within his part of Cardiff. So we have been working on that project now for a few years. It's now fully completed. If you ever have the chance to walk around Grangetown, you will see these lovely streets with planters and trees and cycle paths and people strolling around. It has made a huge difference. So that is a lovely local example within Cardiff. There are other examples like Clenethley, where we've done work within schools. And again, it's the peripheral benefits as well as the green infrastructure that make these such satisfying projects to work on. It also means they sit really well with the ambition for a green recovery. When you think about COVID and you think about the impact that has had on the way we're living, on the way people now desire more time at home, more connection to the outdoors and more space. Green infrastructure plays into all of that. It ticks a lot of the boxes about wanting to use our towns and cities differently. So I'm really excited about the way that green infrastructure could sit within this whole green recovery plan that's being discussed about post COVID. At Arab, we work all through the design process. We take green infrastructure projects from master planning, where we'd come up with a vision for a project, you know, looking at the big picture and try to maximise the benefits whilst outlining the core objectives, through to the outline design phase, where we're trying to understand the natural drainage characteristics of the site and arrive at a conceptual drainage plan, which considers the management train of the design, exceedance runoff paths, as well as the wider benefits. Finally, we do a detailed design where we refine and finalise plans, and this is the final realisation of all the work. With all of these, the key challenge is scale, 
So to meet the challenges that we're seeing, we need to implement these systems across cities and to meet them on a societal level, it has to be at a national scale. And one thing is clear, the traditional way of doing things is not enough. We've been trying to overcome this at each phase of the design process by applying digital approaches. For example, where we would typically spend hours manually mapping, we've developed algorithms to automate this process. Where we have large data sets describing the environment, we've been applying machine learning techniques to find insight that human approaches can't. And where we have complex decisions to make, we've been applying genetic algorithms and mathematical optimizers to carefully balance competing aims. In the master planning phase, a great example of this is where we work with the city of Shanghai, where over the past couple of decades, they've seen rapid urbanization and population growth. The massive scale of urban development has increased the impermeable area for the catchment while reducing green space, leading to increased stormwater runoff across the city. And this has caused serious urban flooding and river pollution in recent years. Shanghai needs an upgrade to its existing drainage system to support its future vision to be an excellent global city in 2035. Parrot won an international design competition to produce the urban drainage master plan for the city of Shanghai. This competition was designed to develop an advanced and implementable strategy for Shanghai's highly populated urban centre. The strategy had to address challenging runoff quantity control and quality targets. Arat first undertook a typology study using mapping and street views. And after thorough research and analysis, this identified 12 typologies in the study area. Machine learning was used to analyse the mapping, establish the proportion of each typology within the study area and flag any potential opportunities. During this, four systems were identified. Governance, green infrastructure, blue infrastructure and grey infrastructure. Governance includes recommendations for reinstating existing assets to meet their design capacity as well as stakeholder engagement. Green infrastructure includes the use of permeable pavements, bias whales and planted attenuation basins as well as green walls to retain and delay stormwater flows. Blue infrastructure included making greater use of river capacity during rainfall events. Where green and blue infrastructure cannot address the issues, grey infrastructure is utilised, which it comprises of strategic tunnels as well as storage. The seamless integration of blue, green and grey infrastructure will not only help the city meet its stormwater challenges, but it will also build climate change resilience and improved well-being of its citizens all being underpinned by digital technology. Hi, my name is Vincent Lee, and I'm an associate principal based in Arab's New York office, and I am also currently the global water skills leader for the firm. New York City serves as an excellent example for successful implementation of green infrastructure, particularly at scale and in, dense, and in a dense urban setting. Over 20 billion gallons of combined sewer overflows enters the New York City Harbor every year, leaving many of the urban waterways unfit for swimming and fishing. For decades, the city has been investing in gray infrastructure to improve its waterways. But since 2012, New York City has committed and is investing over $1.5 billion in green infrastructure to reduce the impacts of combined sewer overflows and to improve the water quality standards of our city's waterways. As a result, over 10,000 green infrastructure assets have been, in, been constructed or are either in, in construction, which alone has created 1,230 greened acres in New York City. The New York City Department of Environmental Protection, or NYC DEP, is leveraging a multitude of green infrastructure practices across public and private areas. But one of the primary means has been to retrofit its streets with these bioswales. The bioswales will not only help to reduce stormwater runoff, but will also uh, provide many other benefits, such as mitigating the urban heat island effect, reducing wastewater treatment costs, create urban biodiversity, sequester carbon dioxide, and improve the neighborhood streetscape. Designing and constructing one bioswale certainly has its complexities in dense urban areas, 
but it's generally manageable. However, when scaling up to hundreds or even thousands, the successful implementation has been dependent on a number of factors. Number one, an overarching vision and leadership. Number two, partnerships and collaboration across multiple agencies, stakeholders, and their communities where these will be implemented. Three, appropriate tools and consistent standards. Four, ensuring that there is evidence to provide confidence in this new paradigm shift in infrastructure. Five, an agreement on the ongoing management of these assets is absolutely critical. And six, ensuring that there is a shared investment for funding both now and in the future. To help deliver hundreds of bioswales for New York City, we followed a prescriptive process of providing a hydraulic analysis of the tributary drainage areas, conducting site walkthroughs, um, providing geotechnical investigations, uh, providing the land surveying, uh, coordinating with utilities and, and transit authorities, and then ultimately providing the engineering design and design services during construction. And with the challenge of delivering the bios these bioswales at scale uh, upon us at Arab, in 2013, we invested first in, in mobile technology and tablets to efficiently collect data in the field and to use this for our planning and our design work. Since then, this has evolved within the firm and we now have a database system that is integrated with our BIM software where changes on the design plans link back to all the platforms that we need across the, this, this prescriptive process from the city to ensure that there is data consistency and quality control. This data then syncs to the city's database. When delivering hundreds of these, it's absolutely critical that there is consistency across all of the data and all of the platforms we are using. We've also used new technology, such as using 360 degree cameras during our site visits for each of the Bioswell sites and using augmented reality where we can show the public the possibilities of green infrastructure while out in the field. This has been a tremendous achievement in augmenting our design process with data and technology innovations to deliver nature-based solutions in the built environment. As the city expands the program to retrofit green infrastructure practices at scale in other public spaces such as parks, schools, and public housing, we can continue to leverage the continuing evolution of technology to keep pace with the greening of New York City. Green infrastructure brings places to life and it could benefit people right across Wales. Our climate is changing and we need infrastructure that is resilient, that can respond and adapt to shock events, drought and flood. And green infrastructure is the best way we can do that. And it's not just that, it's all the wider benefits we've heard about today that come along with it. If we can build new green corridors through our towns and cities, we can regenerate and rejuvenate those places and those communities around it. And we've seen that it can be done at scale. They've done it in New York, it's being done right across the world, so why not here in Wales? But if we're gonna do it, it's gonna take big investment. We need to think big. And a large part of that is understanding and recognizing those wider benefits and the value offered. And ultimately, we need to work out how we're gonna pay for it. Green infrastructure will benefit us and future generations. In building and maintaining these green assets, it's going to create jobs. We know that the green recovery and the low carbon economy is driving growth in Wales. It's probably one of the biggest growth sectors we have. And so when you think about our children and the jobs they will be doing, they'll be looking after these green assets, nurturing them and maintaining them. And not just that, we'll be using high tech systems to monitor and control them so that we can get the best use out of them. So it's an opportunity, it's an opportunity for us to take this forward and we'd love to hear your ideas on how we can make that happen. So if you'd like to join us today, we'll be in the Arab virtual room from 1pm or alternatively just drop us an email.